I'd like to call the. Thank you. Getting everyone's attention. Yeah, I hope you guys can hear me. So I'm going to call the Monday, May 22nd, 2023, Gardner Planning Commission meeting to order. If you all please rise and state the Pledge of Allegiance with me. Sorry about that, guys. I'll try and get better on the mic. If you can't tell, I have no voice. Um, we'll move into roll call, starting on my right. Uh, Combs, present. Commissioner Stowe is a present. Commissioner Ham, present. Commissioner Mater here. Commissioner McNear, present. Commissioner Juniman here. Great. We have a we have a quorum of six um, six in attendance and one absent. Moving down to the consent agenda. All matters listed within the consent agenda have been distributed to each member of the Planning Commission for study. These items are considered to be routine and will be enacted upon by one motion with no separate discussion. If separate discussion is de desired on an item from either the Planning Commission or from the floor, that item may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda. We have two items placed on the consent agenda. Would any member of the public have those items removed and placed onto the regular agenda? Any member of the commission would like to have an item moved to the regular agenda? Seeing none, I'll take a uh, motion on the consent agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda made by McNear with a second by hand. All those in favor, please make it by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. I'm going to say six to zero since, yeah. since Cooper just walked in. Yep. Okay, perfect. I was just going to note for the record that Commissioner Cooper has now joined us. So. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Cooper. Sorry to start without you. That's okay. okay, glad you're here. All right, moving down to the regular agenda item. Item number one, Ari Set Hibachi Food Truck, CUP-23-02. It's a conditional use permit located at 312 West Main. This was continued from March 27, 2023 Planning Commission meeting. Staff, do we have a presentation on this item? Yes, we do. Great. Good evening. Jesse Hunter, Planner, City of Gardner. This item first appeared before the Planning Commission during its March 27th meeting. At that time, the item was presented Staff recommended approval with 16 conditions. The public hearing was held, and after discussion about the site with various questions, the Planning Commission tabled the item until the applicant and owner could be available. Here's a condensed summary of the site. It is located at 312 West Main Street and is about one third an acre in size. It is zoned C1, which is the central business district. The property is surrounded by res residential. The future land use map of the Gardner Comprehensive Plan labels the property as community mixed use. Since the March meeting, staff has met with the applicant and discussed potential solutions, including submitting a revised application with a new site plan showing additional details and proposed improvements to mitigate adverse effects on nearby properties. On May 15th, the applicant submitted an updated application with a completed owner's affidavit, a monthly pest control service report, and photos showing various existing conditions of the site. There was no revised site plan submitted to show additional details, such as proposed improvements or mitigation measures. The photos, however, do show various existing site conditions, including changes made since the March meeting. After consideration of the comments heard during the public hearing and as part of the Planning Commission discussion on March 27th, the consideration of the existing conditions and operations on the property and no additional details associated with an updated site plan, staff believes that the presence of a permanent food and beverage use on this property creates an adverse impact on the surrounding residential properties, 
Staff recommends the Planning Commission forward a recommendation of denial of the application as proposed. If the Commission determines a recommendation of approval to the governing body is in order, there are several possible changes that could be made to the March 27th conditions of approval, such as reducing the length of the conditional use permit or increasing the landscape buffering. With us tonight are the applicant and representatives of the owner, and staff is available for questions. Great. Thank you, Jesse. So if the applicant would like to come forward and um, have a presentation, please state your name and address for the public record. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, you said state name and what was the second Name part? and address for the record. Ah, my name is Steve Knobloch. My address is 15500 Lake Road 8. Okay. Perfect. Thank you guys for having, let, giving us the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, I wanted to start off with, let me get my bearings here and see if this, okay. Some introductions first. I am not the owner of the property. The owner is my father-in-law, uh, Herb Klimt. He's been here local to Gardner since 1990. Prior to that, he has, um, I'm sorry, he was a resident since 89. Prior to that, he and his family have spent weekends, holidays out at Gardner Lake since the 30s. His father was one of the first to build on Gardner Lake. Herb is 84 and has some medical conditions that prevented him from attending the last meeting. Um, he's also not able to attend today. I'm here on his behalf. Uh, my wife and I are working towards obtaining the property to continue with the development of it. Um, he has not been able to maintain it as he likes, and it bothers him. Um, his um, inability to attend today and the previous meeting, he wanted to make sure we stated that um, it was not meant as any disrespect or looking lightly upon the decisions. He, he, was, he wanted to make sure we shared that with him. Um, I am, again, his son-in-law. Um, I've been a gardener my whole life. I've um, graduated from here, I've lived here, my family went to school here. I'm sharing all these things with you so that you know that we are local. We're not from outside of town or <coughs> to the area. Our understanding is from the last meeting, um, there were concerns from both the city and from surrounding residents. Um, as far as the city is concerned, we received a list of 16 items and we've been working with the city to address these items, trying to do the best we can to accommodate them. We are new to commercial property management, um, so we're learning as we go. Um, some of the things, th this is some of the items that we've addressed up to this point. Um, most of them pertain to safety as far as parking, uh, flow of traffic, people going up and placing orders. Um, we have addressed those to the best of our knowledge. Um, We've also moved the uh, trash facilities, encased them as per regulation. So our efforts have been to do whatever we can to meet the requirements. Um, our plan at this point, there were three items that were not included or that we hadn't completed yet. And the reason for that is because they're gonna be a little more in depth. We're gonna have to plan with the city, get more approval, and we just wanted to make sure we did that right. So the fact that they are not finished doesn't mean we aren't addressing them, that we have the intentions of addressing those as best we can. Um, at this point, that's the city items. As far as the residential items, we're not 100% sure if there's something outside of these 16 recommendations uh, that would be included in that list, but I can assure you that we are um, dedicated and we have full intentions of working with the community and making sure that everybody is happy with the arrangement. As, we st as Jesse stated earlier, it is a commercial property. Um, we're just trying to operate a business on it as best we can. And I understand that residents have been used to it being vacant for a number of years, so it will be a change. But um, we feel we are gonna do whatever we can to accommodate them. Um, I guess in conclusion, where we are is that we, we welcome the opportunity to work with you, the community. Um, we've got a business that's been in it's been a business that here for about a year. They employ people, pay taxes, uh, provide a service to the community, and we just want to do whatever is needed to make sure they can continue to do that. That's all I have. Okay. 
Thank you. This is a, not a public hearing item this evening, so we're not going to entertain any public comments. Um, I can tell you, though, that this item, regardless, I'm looking at Dave here, just to kind of prep the audience that this item, regardless, goes to council, whatever happens, and there will be an opportunity for comments then. Is that it does go, correct? It does go to council. The official public hearing was actually held back in March before you as the Planning Commission. Uh, we did have citizen uh, comment at that point in time. We have also had citizen comment into us between that meeting and, and this day. Um, as far as going to council, yes, you're a recommending body. The council is actually the one that makes the decision on the conditional permit uh, issuance, whether to approve or deny it. Um, they usually, I will say, they are not obligated to have a public hearing or to hear from the public at that meeting, but they do have a practice Generally. of asking for the applicant and sometimes the citizens to speak, and that's usually at the mayor's prerogative, so it is not I can't say with 100% Well, I was just thinking that, that typically the first line item is like public comment. Correct. So that could be, I'm just, yep. you know, I just don't want citizens to, to be like, right. well, wait. I just don't want to misrepresent that it's another right. public hearing. But, but it, right, and this isn't a public hearing either, right. so that's why I don't want, you know, citizens to understand that this is just, this is planning commission. There will be a potential opportunity. Usually, I've, I don't think I've not seen public comments as a section on an agenda in quite a while. So... Um, just just and helping them to understand that we already right. did the public hearing um, and just process that's where we're at. Oh, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with that, um, we do have the applicant. Thank you for being here tonight for any questions. Um, I'll go ahead and start the uh, commission question discussion on my, my right, uh, Commissioner Combs. Uh, I, I do have just one overarching question. Okay. So in the 16, there were uh, two mentions. My, my question is, is outside of the, uh, the requirement of having been there, could this body help me remember the frequency in which those, uh, or at least the dumpster or trash receptacles would need to be cleaned or removed? That was one of the concerns in the public hearing, mm -hmm. uh, is, was the smell. Mm -hmm. Did that come up at all, Dave, in your additional discussions because I, I did have a yeah. that is an idea. The applicant the applicant may be able to respond best to something like that as far as the mm -hmm. actual service <coughs> on that uh, dumpster area. Um, I will say things like noise, light, um, smells and odor are subject to our public nuisance codes as well as anything with a conditional use permit. So there are code enforcement actions that can be taken through that process as well whether the I don't know the applicant's representative yeah. may be able to speak better to trash hauling and what goes on there. Absolutely. Sure. Before the public hearing, it was once a week. Since then, it's been changed to two times a week. So it's, it's double that. Okay. Um, and I think I said earlier, but it has been relocated and it's uh, covered. Okay. That answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Sosa? Commissioner Combs is done. I think yes or no. So you said that uh, the when you placed the dumpster had been because it used to be close to the to the fence where actually we moved to. It's I don't know if we have. It, is there on here or do I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 on the same. I guess it would be. Do they have the? Is that in the it's, it's up here. Yeah. Oh, you guys have control here. Let's see. It, it, I believe, was there an aerial, aerial view of the lot? <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so previously it was, I don't know if this will show up, no it won't. Um, you see where the tree is, the open space to the left top corner? That's where it was originally, up in that area. And it's been moved over to the opposite corner, top right. Okay. okay. And I would like to say that we were very concerned when we did, obviously we weren't here the last time, but we heard that there was concerns about odor and that struck home to us. So we went out there and um, I would welcome anyone to go out and so, uh, sample for yourself to yeah. see if, if, if you see <coughs> I've, I've been there recently, I saw it. Okay. And it, looks, it looks better. Thank you. Only 
question for now. Okay. Cheyenne? Thank you. I, I understand. I'm glad that you told us that you are have been a longtime resident of Gardner. Um, I appreciate that. And I know it's a it's a odd place. And as you said, it is um, commercial a commercial use property. I think just I know you haven't completed all of the items, and my understanding is that they they don't have to wait the whole year, like to January, to reapply. Is that correct? They can apply reapply once they've completed all of the items. As you're talking about for the conditional for the, for, use permit, for the conditional use. so there's two things going on here. The conditional use permit, if they go through this process as they're going through right now, they would have to meet all the conditions and anything that was approved through that process, okay? Mm -hmm. To do what you're talking about, our preference would be that the improvements and anything done to the site is done prior to mm -hmm. um, that issuance or prior to at some date certain. <coughs> so if we said within 60 days or 90 days right. of it being issued um, to have the site improvements done that way. Okay. Um, going back and reapplying, you do have the opportunity here also that you could put a time limit on the conditional use permit of you know the end of the year or year and if those things are not performed you would consider a reapplication and may not approve it at that point in time so you, there's some differing options here mm -hmm. um, again as you look at this i wouldn't look at it as everything stops and waits for the improvements and then they come back with okay. an application i think this application needs to be acted upon a recommendation and go to the governing body and then from there whatever time limits or whatever conditions are recommended or approved that would be appropriate does that make sense yeah okay all right um i'm glad i i i just the homes are very close thank you for moving the the, the trash cans um i just would like to know everything that is everything that you and everything that you're planning on doing. Sure, that's fair, so. that's fair. And I do, it seems, and maybe this is this is a poor point of comparison, <laughs> but I realize that it is right on Main Street and there are residents very close. That's, I remember when Hoax was there, so that's, that, I've been here that long, so. Um, the, it seems that there's other establishments that are have similar arrangements, and I guess I would look to see how, how they accommodate things and maybe that's something we can work together with to, to figure out how they're addressing it and we can do the same. Well, thank yeah. you for being willing yeah. to adjust yeah. and make the, yeah. the um, being open to Absolutely. making the accommodation. Sure. I have no other comments or questions. Okay, cool. Uh, Commissioner McGarris. Yeah, so I, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, I'm just a little bit confused here. This looks like a, uh, is this primarily a food trailer? Is that correct? Yes. yes. Why did, I get the idea that it seems like it's trying to be a, a distributed site restaurant, if you will. It just, I mean, it has all the, the components of a permanent site restaurant, but it's kind of distributed. You get your storage out here, you got this over there. You know. uh, is this, are you trying to be a full service restaurant or what are you trying to do? I'm the, uh, if the owners want to discuss, they can. I'm, I'm representing them, they're here as well to, to make sure everything's good. But the idea is just to provide the service. I don't know that it was definitively Pointed out or intentioned to be one or the other. If that, I don't know if that answered your question or not. This is the city staff. Would it be appropriate to ask the, the operator to come up and kind of give us an idea of what their short and long? You can. Uh, they're part of the application. Yes. Can we ask them to come up and give us their short and midterm kind of vision of what, how this lays out and, and will grow? My name's Darren, and I live at 950 Cimarron Trail here in Gardner. Um, the ideal is we, we're a food truck, but we don't want to have to move every day. A lot of places do it where you can only operate 10 hours a day. And we hook up to like water and sewer just because it's easier than having to carry a tank. And that provides smell. So we're trying to prevent that. It's restaurant based, but it's out of a food truck. I have a setup in Okmogi that I did just like this, and it's working great. So we're just trying to bring it to Gardner. 
Sorry, I'm not used to doing all this. No, speaking. you're fine. You're doing <laughs> fine. fine. No, you're answering the questions perfectly. Are there others that you have? Nope. I just wanted to kind of hear what, what yeah, your plans it's, were. It's, uh, eventually, I'd like to open a restaurant, but right now, I'm I'm using what I have to see how it goes. I guess my, my the thing what caught my eye was the fresh food being stored off in a in a storage shed. Yeah, it, it that seems a little and different. Everything. Yeah, it's it made with the health department requirements and everything that okay. I've worked with the health department for years with this. If they're good with it, then yep. it sounds like it's yes, sir. All right. As long as it's six inches off the ground and stored in containers and not in, we're we're safe. Right. Very good. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Any other questions, McGinnis? Okay, moving on down, Commissioner Gentleman, we have our applicants with us. Uh, question for staff: Could you elaborate on why you're rec recommending denial? I don't know if I really caught that in the report. Yeah. Originally, the staff recommendation back in March was for approval with a long list of of conditions, and I think the intent from hearing the public side of this and and understand when staff formulates its staff reports, the original reports and its original recommendations, we don't get the benefit necessarily of knowing what the public's concerns are and what is going on. So we're evaluating these things based on the code and regulations that are there. Um, so back in March, we had a long list, about I think 16 conditions <coughs> we recommending at that point in time. As we went back through this process and staff met with the applicants' representatives, um, as well as hearing the public comment from that March meeting, we just felt that the list of conditions and the, you know, the things that just needed to be improved to make this even compatible with the neighborhood or the neighboring residences was pretty arduous and probably would not be able to happen. We didn't have much confidence that it could be done in a timely fashion. So that is why we changed our recommendation, the incompatibility with the nearby residential area as well as the performance side of this. Any other questions? Okay, we can come back around too, no problem. Mr. Cooper, anything off the top of your head right now? No, okay, I'll look back to my right and see if there are any Anything came up down here from uh, Commissioner Combs? Yeah. Commissioner Sosa? Uh, yeah, no, okay, Commissioner Ham? Yeah, I just go back to, I know that there used to be a permanent restaurant on that site, and I just think about what the capabilities of a brick and mortar restaurant are able to do versus a food truck, and that just really kind of bothers me especially just considering I'm looking at the pictures and I'm looking at how close I'm thinking if a car backs up into a parking lot that exhaust is going right into that house that is right on the other side of that fence like that's their backyard and so I'm just thinking about things like that just I understand that it was there um, and I understand that it's commercial. I just, um, the limitations of the spread out and everything that we're looking at, um, people sitting outside, the noise, uh, the capacity, just what the homeowners hear versus if it's an actual physical building where the people are inside versus people sitting out at parking at picnic tables and backing up right into those people, like their, their quality of life is affected. And so that's just a really big sticking point for me. Okay. Any, anything else you want to add? No, okay. I'm done now. No, 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 pause, so we can take all the time we want. So, McNair, go ahead, you're good. Gentlemen, you thought maybe something was gonna come to mind? Yeah, it's just a, just a unique site. Sometimes with with uh, what we're what we're dealing with here, and I know this whole process with the food trucks has been going on for a while. So um, I just want to make sure we get it right um, for in case there are other other businesses that come along down the road for ask for these conditional use permits. Um, that just be my comment for the rest of the commissioners. Okay, so that's good. 
Good. Madam Chair, if you don't mind, I'm gonna chime sure. in just a little bit here um, in that line. As you recall, with the ordinance changes we had about a year, year and a half ago, when we looked at this, this is one of those reasons why we started looking at when is a conditional use permit required, when's a temporary use permit required. Remember, the temporary use permit is really intended for those true mobile food truck elements, okay? The, the truck's going to move off site when it's outside its business hours, it's coming back to the site, it's the only truck operating on, on the site. The reason this is before you with the conditional use permit is for the reason that you heard earlier from the applicant's representative, um, things like hooking up to the water, the sewer, the utilities, now this is becoming a permanent fixture on the property and a permanent use. Um, as we've compared this, just as you have been in your discussions, a bricks and mortar restaurant building, we would be seeing an improvement being made to the property as well as a new building. So you would see things like a new parking lot, the landscaping, the signage. So one of the reasons the conditional use permit process was placed into, into the code was the idea that we should be treating these more permanent fixtures or semi-permanent fixtures similar to a bricks and mortar type of restaurant operation. So that's, that's part of the conditional use permit process. And as we discussed when we were looking at those code recommendations, we recognized that there were some sites because of their context with residential around them and things like that, that we would be in some of these difficult scenarios. Now we've had others um, like Moose's who was recently approved, who's in more of a commercial, they're in the downtown area, they've got adjacent commercial activity, so therefore the sounds, the light, the, the odors are a little bit more oriented towards downtown. Here we do have those kinds of conflicts. So that's the struggle that you have before you, and that's why if, if you do go different than denial, I think the conditions and under what parameters are gonna be very important. Oh, there, David, go ahead. Thank you. Um, you bring up mooses, and that's one that we were referring to because we know that they're right up against a residence as well um, on the back of their lot. So anything, again, to my point earlier, anything that um, maybe they did that helped your, your decision, we'd be definitely willing to talk to you about that and accommodate it. And just as a last comment, that um, this lot was purchased as a commercial lot with the intention of being a business, be it a long time ago, but it was purchased with that intent. So if we decline here, I'm struggling to understand what we can do with that property. So just something to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McNear, did you indicate yes, one other thing? Uh, this is the staff. Uh, if uh, this sure seems like it would be, uh, I'm surprised it hasn't come into a restaurant or something already uh, prior to this use of the property. If we have, if this thing continues to move forward, uh, would it be possible if somebody did come in and say, I want to build a, a brick and mortar restaurant, you know, which is actually more in line with the, with the original use and the highest, probably the highest and best use of that land. Uh, is that something that could be changed over to or, or what happens to these guys if, if somebody wants to come in and build a, a restaurant? I was just checking the zoning here. I just want to double check everything. So this is, this is considered a C1 commercial lot. So regardless of the conditional use permit decision that's made here, the property itself retains the same development rights as any C1 property. So there are a ver variety of commercial uses that would be allowed to occur, but they would have to be built and put on the site to our standards, the specific standards for building and the site design. So they'd have to meet all of those requirements. I guess I understand where you're coming from there, Dave. I guess what my question really is is, uh, so somebody wants to come in and put, uh, it could be a C store, it could be anything, you know, and, and wants to put something in that space. And we've got a conditional use out here for these guys. Uh, you know, uh, what happens yeah. if somebody wants to come in and what happens to these guys yeah. uh, that operating one, their business if that, if that happens? That, that's actually my question. Yeah. That, that would be between the landowner and whatever the lease agreement is with this operator. Okay. So depending on what their private arrangement is, which is nothing that we can take into consideration. You know, we're as long as the zoning, as long as the uses of the code and the zoning remains right. and consistent, we're okay. Right, and so whether the owner has options that they can go and pursue a greater development during this time, I don't know what's in those lease agreements. Those are between the operators and the, and the landowner. 
Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I have, that was clear in my mind. Thank you so much. I, I also do want to note that with Moose's operation here in downtown, the property to the south is zoned commercial as well. So all the property surrounding Moose's is zoned commercial. It is not zoned residential, even though there may be a residential use there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I did have another question, if I may. I'll entertain it. Thank you. Um, the property, which her point owns as well, but right next to that, to the west, is also commercial, I believe, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so over to North Circle Drive, from the east edge of this property line to North Circle Drive is zoned uh, C1. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And that's a vacant lot. Right. Okay, cool. Thanks for that confirmation, Dave. Um, something I've gotten out of practice doing, asking as chair, was there any ex parte communication received by the commission? Anybody reach out with comments, questions? If so we want to make sure we disclose that. So I'm just kind of looking around. I got to get in better practice of doing that. So I thought I'd ask for this item. Okay, okay. great. Uh, any other questions, comments, discussion points? I don't have anything else for staff. If not, I'll entertain a motion on this item. I'll make that motion. Okay. After review of the application CUP-23-02, a conditional use permit for Arcea Kabachi at 312 West Main Street and staff cover memo dated May 17, 2023, the Planning Commission recommends denial of the application as proposed and forwards the application to the governing body. Second. Okay, we have a motion made by McNear with a second by hand. Does anyone have questions on the motion? All those in favor, please make it by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Motion carries seven to zero with all in favor. And as noted earlier, this will go to the governing body for their consideration and uh, decision. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you guys. Appreciate you being in attendance tonight. Okay, regular agenda item number two. Fairfield Development, Z-22-09, rezoning. PDP-22-09, preliminary development plan, and PP-22-06, preliminary plat. South of West, 183rd Street, in the vicinity of South Poplar Street. Continued from April 24, 2023, planning commission meeting. We have a staff presentation tonight. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. As long as it's off, I just yeah, wanted to make yeah, sure. They're all yeah. <laughs> Gets a little noisy yeah, in the thanks, background. It's hard to hear. Thanks, Bob. Didn't so, um, Dave Napa, Community Development Director with the City of Gardner. I'm going to go through the process a little bit. I'm going to try to be quick with these slides in my overview presentation. This has been back and forth a couple times, so I don't want to um, go into a lot of detail unless you have specific questions, but I certainly want to give an overview for the audience that's here tonight. So. As you'll recall, this was before the Planning Commission on March 27th. You held your public hearing at that point in time and considered the item. Staff was recommending approval with the three conditions that you see on the current slide, and Planning Commission recommended denial after the uh, meeting on the 27th. The governing body then considered the item on April 17th and sent it back to the Planning Commission pending further investigation of traffic alternatives. There was concern about the traffic impact on the adjacent neighborhood. Um, and then the Planning Commission had this item before it on the 24th of April, one week after the governing body uh, had it, and therefore the Planning Commission requested additional time to consider potential alternatives. And on May 1st, the governing body approved the request for additional time um, to have this before you tonight on May 22nd. So that's the brief overview of the process. Brief overview of the property. The parcel is approximately 42 acres. It's located south of 183rd Street, Cherokee Street at Poplar. Um, it's currently zoned R1 single family. The future land use is identified as medium density residential in the sub area plan um, of the comprehensive plan. 
The adjacent land uses, as you know, are single family residential, primarily to the east. Um, there's duplex to the north. Then you have the warehousing in Edgerton to the west and vacant land to the south or agricultural land to the south. The revised preliminary plat and preliminary plan um, have come up between the April 24th timeline and tonight's meeting. So staff met with the applicant. We had discussions about changes that could potentially be made that would reduce the traffic impacts in the uh, area and therefore several changes were made to the plan. What you see before you here are the two exhibits, the plat, which is on your left hand side and the plan, the preliminary development plan on the right hand side. The green shaded area are single family lots, just so you're aware of that. <coughs> the differences between the original development plan that was before you on March 27th and what's before you tonight um, have changed several part or physically have changed in several ways. Um, as regard to road connections, this will only be connected to uh, 183rd Street via Poplar. So you'll have a north-south street that's running off of Poplar through the area, which is identified as phase one. Um, the connection that was proposed at 184th Terrace has been removed from the plan. In regard to the total number of housing units, the housing units have been reduced to 88 units instead of what was proposed at 121. Single family units were proposed at 27, have been reduced to 19. Again, that's that gray shaded, shaded area that's identified with the RP2 uh, zoning area on your uh, graphic before you. Um, that area is approximately 8.2 acres. And then from a multifamily units, the townhomes that are being proposed, uh, that number was reduced from 94 in the original proposal in March to 69, and that's on 9.4 acres of the property. That's in that kind of, I'll call it off yellow to brownish color that's identified as the RP4 area. In addition to no connections onto 184th Terrace, um, there also have been movement of the drainage facility down to the south end of the phase one area. So what I want to make sure everybody understands is there's two phases as part of this preliminary development plan. The first phase is outlined in red, okay, that you see before you. It has a combination of the RP2 zoning and the RP4 zoning as described earlier. Then the phase two area, which is outlined in purple, the bulk of that area, approximately 24.4 acres, will retain its R1 zoning, which it currently has, the zoning to RP2 and RP4 will still extend into phase two, but nothing in phase two can be built until there are connections made to either the east or to the south via new roads that would connect eventually up to Gardner Road or to 188th Street or some other street of that manner. So at this point in time, the preliminary development plan that's before you is the revised plan for phase one and then phase two as shown. Your potential action tonight for state statutes, you can take one of the following actions. You can res resubmit your original recommendation, giving the reasons uh, for that, or you can submit a new and amended recommendation to the governing body. I just wanna note here for you all, if you fail to take any action tonight, this will go to the governing body and that failure to act will be considered a resubmission of your original recommendation. So just be aware of that. The city attorney is here tonight to help with any of the questions that we may have on process moving forward. I've placed before you two suggested motions. The first one in light of the Kansas statutes, the first one is motion to resubmit the original planning commission recommendation of denial, or you may wish to submit a new recommendation of approval. And with that, we've expanded the number of conditions. There were originally three. We've added four and one is new. I've highlighted it in red because it came up today in staff uh, discussion. I don't think it'll create a problem for the applicant. It's just noting that the traffic, impact, the traffic impact study would have to be revised to reflect the new revised plans. That would be a perfunctory thing that would need to be done. Otherwise, uh, conditions four through six 
are simply cleanups that need to be added to that plat and to that preliminary development plan. So with that, I will stop and answer any questions that you may have, noting that the applicant is present too. Okay. We also have the fire district here uh, per your request at the last meeting, and we also have uh, public works available for questions as well. Fantastic, thanks Dave. I think now would be a good time. We'll see if the applicant has anything else they'd like to add. I um, appreciate you get, getting the other folks engaged as, as asked. So if the applicant has anything else to add um, as presentation, please come forward. State your name and address for the public work. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Curtis Hall, and I'm an attorney with the Polsonelli firm. Uh, my address is 900 West 48th Place, Suite 900, Kansas City, Missouri, 64112. Uh, representing the applicant. Uh, just introduce our team again real quick. I do have Doug Bohai with ownership, um, Greg Watson with our, our civil engineer, and Janelle Clayton is our traffic engineer. Um, appreciate staff and their review and the report. And, uh, did want to indicate that we did uh, add a traffic letter. It uh, answered a couple of questions that the council had, uh, one of them which was, what is this due to traffic? Um, on 183rd Street if we do uh, kind of what we're agreeing to do here tonight, which is really the biggest issue we had last time with everybody, and that was the uh, additional traffic that might, say, cut through the uh, subdivision to the, to the east. Um, and we've really cut off all the, all the inter, inter connection, if you will, to the street network to our east. And so we're all funneling all the traffic to 183rd Street, as staff indicated in the report. Um, we removed and re reduced some of our units in order to uh, make the fire department happy about that. Uh, we had meetings and discussions with the staff and we're comfortable with the revision to the plan. Uh, we think it r removes the, the primary objections that the residents had in terms of the uh, additional traffic through the neighborhood. There won't be any, any additional trips through their neighborhood now because we're cutting off all the traffic and we understand that going forward, we can't do anything to the south unless and until we get uh, some access, additional access to Gardner Road or South 108th Street. So we understand all of those things. We agree with the stipulations uh, that are in front of you. Um, don't have any issues with those. We're ready to answer any questions if you have any. Otherwise, we're just here to answer questions. Thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, um, as the last item was, this is not a public hearing. I'm not going to entertain any public comments. This item will be before the uh, governing body and they will have a, um, I hope so, a public comment section um, on the, the agenda. Like I said, I've, it's been a long time since I've not seen one, so pretty confident there'll be an opportunity to speak there. Um, so with that, let me ask the ex parte question and try and get better about that. Anybody on the commission receive any ex parte communication? I did. Okay, great. Um, I don't know what you, I received it from um, a resident in Fairfield um, earlier this uh, evening um, just to express concerns over um, what's going on with the developer um, displeasure. Okay, um, and do you feel like you can still make a fair and impartial decision? Yes. Maybe no, okay. no. Okay, and just a note to that resident, uh, we always appreciate public comment, but because we're not doing a public hearing, we're not gonna read that email in the record because that would be for people who are here and not able to speak tonight. So, uh, not to discourage people out there from, from contacting the Planning Commission, but it would potentially not be part of the record when that day. Thank you. Thanks for the guidance, Spencer, appreciate it. Okay, so we'll start um, commission discussion. We have the applicant here and um, staff. We also have some special invited guests, I think the fire department at all. So, Commissioner Combs, do you want to kick us off? Maybe a comment to the question. Sure. I'm reducing the number of homes, regardless of the type, doesn't immediately. I do have a question regarding the uh, homes on the west compared to the single family homes that would be on the east of that divider line. 
just curious if these were all single family homes versus uh, the town home or multifamily uh, type of structure. Would the value of the surrounding properties be affected uh, in a more positive way versus a, a, a negative way, which currently is just a perception? identified because I, I and then I'll, I'll close um, I I understand that there was a concern uh, related to the single family home properties in town and being built on the west side where uh, the town home or multifamily is going to be built now I mean the reason that there that the single family homes were not planned to be constructed there would and or was Outside of the traffic, I'm now trying to understand how this might impact the value of the surrounding residents uh, with the type of development that is being requested. So, so there are two things I want to address. With the traffic concern first, I want to address by reducing the amount of units, number one, it will impact the traffic because the amount of traffic generated is reduced. Oh, also. by default. Correct. So I just want to make sure that, that that's noted up front. In regard to property values, um, I will tell you that it's a, it's a little outside our purview of consideration. We generally are considering the land use relationships. So when we look at these things, um, there's numerous studies that have been done on property values when they're next to, pro to properties that are of a different land use than um, what may be existing. Um, some are positive, some are negative. So there's a percep perceptual side of this, there's a market side of this, and then there's also the side of it as they look at the value of the land and trying to um, uh, utilize that uh, property to its best purposes. Um, in this case, another influencing factor is already the existing warehouses that are in this area. They're not very far from what's proposed here or what's existing from a residential standpoint. Um, so we do have on the Edgerton side of this several warehouses that are in place already and a new one that is also being built. So. I would tell you from a land use perspective, we do look to try to step down the intensity of uses. So if we have a commercial use or an industrial use, we try to buffer it with uses of a higher intensity, uh, lower intensity than at commercial and industrial, but slightly higher intensities than single family. So a lot of times you'll see apartments that are next to commercial land uses before you go into a single family residential neighborhood. So it, the common practice is to have that step down. Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, no, no other questions. OK. Commissioner Sosa. So uh, I understand that the main concern uh, last time that we discussed this was the traffic. So now that they are uh, reducing the number of units, so uh, do they submit another traffic report, or is it something they're going to submit later? That's part of the motion, but we don't have it to review. Yeah. We're supposed to have been working on that, I thought. So, so in regard to traffic, I will tell you, as this plan was being revised, and it was being looked at, as indicated by the applicant's representative, there was a letter that was provided that showed that there was a decrease in the amount of traffic the suggested motion for if you go with the approval type of that, that's why a number seven is there, those numbers would have to be incorporated into that traffic impact study. The original study was provided with the original plan. So um, with that, it was felt by our public works department, our city engineer, that the number had been reduced effectively. The other part of this was, was that by disconnecting from 184th Terrace, this traffic would not be going into or directly into the adjacent neighborhood to the east. It would have to go up to Cherokee or 183rd to come out of this development. 
So. Mr. Pam? Uh, going back and looking at my notes from our uh, last meeting and traffic, uh, like traffic and 184th, which um, when I was going through our packet, I was like, okay, they've taken care of that. And they've lowered um, the, uh, the number of uh, homes that they are um, proposing. And I like the fact that phase two can't be complete until there are more uh, more uh, arterial uh, routes. Um, looking at my notes, that seems to check off everything that was addressed at the public hearing uh, last month. Um, and uh, when I was reading the packet, we were sans uh, number seven <laughs> in the packet, and I was like, oh, I want to know what the traffic impact study says with a reduced uh, amount of homes. So I'm very comfortable with this because it seems to have checked a lot of the boxes for the public comments at the last meeting. You're comfortable without seeing the study? They're just I, saying. I would it. like to see. I, I would like to see to, that yeah. to know just how know far that is. we are off of those so, other numbers. Yeah. So we do have two people here that could probably respond to that. Perfect. Okay. The public works director is here tonight from the staff side and the traffic engineer who generated both the TIS, the traffic impact study, and the letter with the changes. I would um, love if to. If you would like to hear from them, you could certainly have them come yes. up and speak to that. Yeah. yeah. So I would appreciate that. Like a good time now to, yes. to pause? And, yes, I would Okay, like yeah. If, if we could, you know, get the actual, you know, what was that number before? Uh, um, the number before was 1,016. Okay. Yes, I was Perfect. Like, <laughs> there you go. Okay. About, right? So, yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And 1,500 was our max allowed. Was the max allowed. 1,016 mm -hmm. was what they were looking at um, with the previous numbers. Perfect. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. careful with the numbers too that you're talking about because there's a difference between overall generation and then I think the 1016 number may have been a number that was going towards the 184th Street in particular now yes that that's cut off you, yeah you're we not should be able see to see those, those breakdowns then. okay and okay. whatever letter was referred to the yeah. council had I guess okay. so maybe there was some more information that could have been shared with the Commission because this I don't like seeing last-minute updates here I don't know what the updated traffic impacts are. <coughs> and I knew nothing to share with council via the letter. I just need some material. Okay, Janelle Clayton with Merge Midwest Engineering, located at 2668 West Catawba Street in Olathe, Kansas. Um, so we did prepare a, a memo when we looked at what would happen now with this reduced number of units and without directly connecting in to the properties to the east. I was just talking with Kellen because there are nine single family homes with, on the other side of that that would technically still be able to use 184th Street. So nine single family homes could you know, technically still get into the neighborhood. But the rest of all the other development will utilize Poplar up to 183rd Street. So um, we can certainly reflect that in the revised traffic study analysis. But what we looked at, um, you know, when we looked at traffic coming up Poplar to 183rd Street, we were really putting all our traffic onto 183rd Street and to seeing how many trips that would add. Um, 183rd Street is classified as a minor arterial and by city standards that can take 12,000 vehicles per day and up to a 42,000 vehicle per day limit for a major arterial. So if we look at the very low end of 12,000 vehicles per day, um, we did traffic counts on 183rd Street and existing vehicles per day is 2,878. So you can add you know, upwards close to 10,000 vehicles per day still on that facility and still be within that lower threshold of your minor arterial standards. 
Um, when we added, when we put all of our traffic onto Poplar up to 183rd, um, we were adding just 900 cars per day, so we're up to 3,778 vehicles per day, still well, well below the 12,000 vehicle threshold that we have. Okay, all right, thank you. I think yeah. that looks like that might answer questions, or at least that specific one. Yes, thank you. Did you have a follow-up? No, I have. Yeah. Might have. Okay, all right, I think that answered the specific. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Yes, so that was, that was my concern about knowing what, um, and like you said, that was the other one was the 1,500 and the 1,016 was with the other, with the 184. So this, um, knowing this, that helps me make me feel better, so thank you. Definitely, yeah, that, that helps put it into perspective. Yes. Because I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that makes sense, routing all that the yeah. tra trip traffic directly to 183rd, so it's using a different matrix because mm -hmm. it's a different mm -hmm. classification of a road. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner McNeil. First off, I wanted to say thanks to staff and uh, everybody uh, with the developer and their team for putting a lot of hard work into this. And uh, you know, it shows through what you delivered to us this evening that you put a lot of thought and effort and uh, Came back to us with uh, a lot of the concerns addressed. I got a couple of questions and concerns I wanted to start off with. In lots one through 19, which is the uh, basic involving in the cul de sacs in Fairfield. The uh, single family there? All the single families. Uh, just out of curiosity, and I don't know the answer to this, staff, maybe you can help us. What happens? Those are actually built in the, in the what used to be the Fairfield subdivision was intended for next phase. Does the deed restrictions and covenants from Fairfield apply to these residences or not? And if not, how did that does that get superseded or how does all that work? So that would be between the developer and the homeowners that move in. The city is not a party to covenants and restrictions that are associated with subdivision development. We don't enforce those. We do not uh, have a say in those. So how those are written and how that's done, this developer, this could go with a phase, you know, whatever the name of the subdivision is, phase five, and it has its own specific set of covenants and restrictions that are associated with that. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, to the developers then, how do you propose to deal with deed restrictions, covenants, and how do you plan on uh, dealing with the neighborhood and existing uh, covenants and deed restrictions? Thank you, Kurt Holland. Really quick, Kurt. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, and just, Curtis is welcome to, to answer this question if he wants to. I do just want to remind you also, we're on a rezoning application, uh, and our land development code sets out some specific factors and considerations for you all to discuss. Okay. Um, if, that, if that was inappropriate, just so let me. That's not necessarily something that will factor into whether or not you grant it. Um, if Mr. Holland wants to enlighten you all, he's an adult and he gets to do that. But I'll, uh, you, you don't have to. I didn't, I didn't mean to ask an No, and I wasn't saying you did anything wrong. I just want to make sure. If you don't like Mr. Holland's answer, uh, it's not necessarily a ground to deny it. My only comment, be his answer, that's all my only comment is well, they'll be separate. Uh, they'll have our own independent, separate declarations. It won't, okay. uh, won't be part of that uh, development to the uh, east. There's no plan for that. Okay. But typical residential declarations that very common. Okay, so it'll be like its own subdivision? It is its own subdivision. Okay. Yes. That, that's what I really wanted to understand. Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. Appreciate that. Uh, Sorry for making that more difficult. No, no, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that's a really, we, yeah, we don't have that. I, I just wanted to know a, how it works. A, at least ask the question now we know. What else do we uh, have? Okay. Uh, in phase, so is phase one and phase two, they operate independently of each other? In regard to the preliminary development plan, they operate as one preliminary development plan. So it's, when we have preliminary development plans, we identify a phasing plan as part of that. So phase one and two are part of this preliminary development plan. What's a little bit unusual here is that the zoning for the RP2 and the RP4 currently extends into phase two. So the rezoning would have this current boundary as you show there, but there is not a specific set of uh, preliminary development plan parameters for phase two at this point in time. Thank you. And then uh, if we go into a phase two, uh, is it my, I, the way this thing reads, it sounds like they would have to cut 
an additional entrance either to some some other place before any of that could be constructed. Is that correct? Correct. It it would be something that would attach or would have to connect to the east and work its way back to Gardner Road. Essentially, is what we would be trying to do at that point. Um, the phase two area would have to have its own separate, basically a revised PDP, if you would, a preliminary development plan that would then show that. But that would be part of the connections. Um, it could extend on an alignment that is equivalent to where 186 comes out at Gardner Road. It could extend to the south down to 188 and connect. There's a there's multiple ways that that could happen. Would that also include any connection to Butter? There is potential for that, but that would be a consideration that we would look at at, at the future revised PDP. So that would be a that would be part of a Correct. future. Correct. I want to be careful with it because I know at the last meeting when we discussed this, there are things with wetlands, there's things with streamway setbacks up there, so we're not even sure what may be or may not be feasible in that area. Just to be clear, though, just so I make sure I understand, if we go to a phase two, there cannot be a connection to Butternut unless it comes through the process. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going through my questions. So give me just a second, please. Next question. Why were phase one and two split? Well, that, that came and arose from the conversation between staff and um, the applicant early on in the process. They have, in the past, oh, sorry. In the past, they have come up um, with a plan for the whole area, all as part of one. Now, you'll remember back in 2018 or so, there was an application just for the zoning without a preliminary development plan. As a result of that, the applicant went ahead and went back to the drawing boards and came back with several iterations of plans showing the full development. Um, <coughs> staff was not comfortable with some of the densities and things that were being shown, and the idea was by breaking this up into densities to they could start this development, but without those connections to the east and to the south, staff did not feel that it was timely to go ahead and have any type of specific development plan for that area. Okay, okay uh, what happens, to, this is for uh, fire district, what happens to fire codes with phase one and or phase two? Can you give us an idea how that works? Thanks, Chief. My name is Brad Ralston, Fire Marshal for Fire District Number One, two four eight zero zero West One Hundred Ninety First Street, Gardner. Um, to answer your question on that, for this first phase, um, the way I understand it is that we have less than one hundred units for um, multifamily and less than thirty. So in the fire code, that requires just the one exit. So having them shut off 184th Terrace and then cul-de-sac the end and that meets those equivalents. Once we get over those additional um, units, the fire code states that you have to have two separate remote entrances or egress routes. So having that cut off in phase two over to Gardner Road or down south would meet those requirements. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Any, anything else? Anything else? Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. That's it. I Thanks, everyone. Commissioner Chinaman. Um, <clears throat> similar to Commissioner Ham, uh, yeah, I was reading through the report, and it seemed like it to me it addressed a lot of the concerns that, that I had and I heard from the community as far as generating traffic through the development, um, still providing a buffer between the existing single-family homes with, with new single-family homes and providing that buffer between the heavy commercial use and this interesting development. So um, I don't really have any more questions. Commissioner Cooper. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, has there been any attempt to collaborate in terms of the homeowner association issues with the, with the residential? Yeah, I'm going to jump in. Sorry. Uh, Pretty broad question. <laughs> doesn't necessarily need to answer. Right. I'm just, I'm interested to know if the, um, the 
property is going to be managed similarly to other uh, multifamily units in the area, or if there's been any consideration of that? I, I really don't understand your question because I don't, it's so broad, and uh, I, I mean, I don't know how the other unit properties are managed in the area, so I'm not sure what exactly what you mean. They'll certainly be managed <laughs> uh, professionally. I don't, I'm not so sure what the concern is, though. Sorry. Is it going to be managed by each individual property owner, or is it going to be managed by a homeowners association? Um, the, uh, the the the, the ho I'm not exactly sure how we'll do it just yet. Um, you know, there'll be some declarations. There'll likely be an association. So uh, these homes, whether they're single family or townhomes, would likely be subject to a homes association, but we haven't figured all that part out yet. Has there been any, um, and this is probably beyond my authority to ask, but has there been any um, attempts at communication and cooperation between the, the, the developments that's already there? As far as what? As far as they'll maintain their properties we'll maintain ours so there won't be any need to necessarily cooperate with them in that regard we've had neighborhood meetings with them um, we've had hearings we know how they feel about or certainly felt about the traffic issue but I'm still not quite clear what you're getting at um, there are developments all over the city that have been uh, you know started out So, 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 uh, apologize. I don't know that that's fair to. It and, may not be fair, yeah. but I and am I, and, and, a citizen, and you know, I'm on the planning commission, and I'm looking at all the planning around me and around the other citizens, and I, it's an issue that I have concern about. So. Well, that's maybe that's to your point, Commissioner Cooper, and I'll look to staff to help me out here. But as we go through the process, depending on you know how these plans roll out, there are certain you know codes and certain. Um, materials that are allowed in the building phases and stages so you know depending on how all this works out there is that opportunity I'm kind of looking at Dave to maybe help confirm what I'm thinking here that you know they can't just build a, a clapboard type of cardboard house right. there might not have so, been as stringent type of um, material list as so we have if, if the right so. if the um, if the Again, proposed rezoning and the development plan the preliminary development achieve approval through the city uh, council, the governing body, a final development plan then comes in, it comes to the planning commission, it includes things like the architecture and the design standards that are incorporated, all those details get added to that final development plan process. A preliminary development plan, we don't require those details because it's a significant effort to put that together um, without, without necessarily having approval already. So, that happens. In regard to your question about property maintenance and that, um, the city has general codes and regulations that all property owners, whether it's multifamily, single family, commercial, industrial, uh, are required to follow. Um, if they are not doing that, then generally we receive the complaints or we receive some type of uh, uh, notice and we pursue it through code enforcement. I don't know if you want yeah, to. Sure. So, Dave kind of hit the important part, which is that once these are built, um, unless are you managing it yourself as the property developer? I, I believe your, I believe the townhomes would be for okay. sure. But so I, I mean, generally, once it's built, the planning commission, your role is sort of done. Um, down the road, if there's an issue, I mean, we have city nuisance codes. So those nuisance codes would apply to this the same as it would apply to anyone else's property, whether it's multifamily, single family, commercial. So if there's an issue with upkeep. Typically, I would say a complaint-driven procedure, um, as opposed to the city driving around and enforcing through all the way through code. So that's how that would come about. Um, but yeah, other than that, as far as the development plan and the rezoning, um, we are getting we're. This isn't part of rezoning. So if you guys think about whether this should be R two four or not, uh, thinking down the road of what this might look like, is it considered is not part of should we rezone this to R two four? 
Um, and as it relates to the preliminary development plan, I hear you, and, and certainly nobody wants to have um, and any properties built with the intent, and I don't think there's any intent to let them go by the wayside. Um, thank you for shaking your head to <laughs> confirm that for me. Well, so, yeah, I mean, it's, but yeah, it's it, not in anybody's best interest. So. Right, it's, and it's not in the developer's best interest to do that. like to put a comment out there. I, I just, as I was listening to this conversation, I'm thinking back to 2008, 2009, which is that time, that time frame, and back to a um, subdivision that was called Prairie Property, over there northeast of the high school. Uh, at that time, uh, they, the, the deed restrictions, this is why I asked the deed restrictions and covenants question. Uh, the deed restrictions and covenants at that time had a uh, at a 2,000 square foot minimum for single family or single floor, uh, 1,800 for single floor and like 2,500 for multi floors. And they had certain sizes and certain facades and certain things in that. And then 2008 hit. And what happened was uh, the subdivision went broke. And subsequently, there was 28 lots that were sparkled in between built houses. Uh, at that time, those built houses were built had been built out in the three and four hundred thousand dollar range, which in two thousand eight was a pretty pricey house. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, somebody, a developer came in and said, "I want to build. I'll buy all these lots out of uh, out of the broke subdivision." And they put twelve hundred and one square foot front to back splits in next to, in which were at that time probably one hundred and fifty, one hundred and seventy thousand dollar houses next to four hundred thousand. Needless to say, there was a lot of people that were upset. And that's kind of the. I know. I, I'm nothing just saying this. This is, the, this is just, what happens. I feel like it's noise. I know, but that's like noise for the meeting. You know what I mean? Okay. Just, I appreciate you bringing that up, but I, I don't want us to get wrapped around the accident. No, I'm not. And, and HOAs. Yeah, and, yeah, and I'll jump in. So and, just as, and I think Dave hit this earlier in the staff report, but this was sent back to you all from the city council because they all could not make a decision based on the traffic. So this is down to you by the city council, essentially specifically asking you guys check into the traffic a little bit more. Um, and we've heard about the traffic, um, so we can hear more. And I, you know, if you guys are, are undecided as to the traffic question, you know, maybe redirect our focus a little bit into that. Um, I don't think I don't. I think the traffic concern has been addressed. So I appreciate you roping us back in, Spencer. Um, I did have one question, and then I'll see if. Commissioners of others, why why um, the phasing? I get that, but why why the inclusion of the zoning for just a piece of phase two? Now I've always heard that to be bad planning practice um, for what could be viewed as spot zoning. So why are we doing that? Yeah. So there's two things going on. The original application for the rezoning has a legal boundary that's associated with it and that's already been created so those boundaries have been somewhat fixed by the application okay so we're retaining that boundary element um, those legal descriptions uh, were put together that way it is also felt that that rp2 zoning is still a good buffer between the existing zoning and what goes on to the south whatever it may be. It could be a continuation of more single family. It could be some other type of housing uh, that hasn't even been proposed at this point in time. So we were very comfortable with the idea that we stick with the boundary, the legal boundary that has been defined as part of this zoning application and not changing that. And again, knowing that the specifics of how anything is developed within those zoning districts will be part of the phase two preliminary development plan revision forward well but so then I guess my question then within the motion um, item number four is correcting errors within the legal description on both the preliminary plot and preliminary development plan so technically this could be corrected as there's, well there's a difference between a typographic I, and I, the asking, actual application yeah, I'm asking because yeah. because it, it just said errors correct so I didn't know just asking for a little bit more detail yeah. into what that was and and just like I said just from previous Planning Commission meetings and seeing these things quite a few times. It, it's a lot cleaner if the boundaries all mesh and it works that way. Right. Uh, unfortunately, as we went through this 
resolution process and trying to get to a point where we had things resolved. Um, this left the zoning boundary the way it was. And I say, unfortunately, in the sense of it's not as clean, but wow. the boundary is wow. there. And again, anything that happens in that phase two has to come back through with the revised preliminary development plan. So let me also ask this, um, what, I guess, why, why is that small piece of the, the additional rezonings in phase two, why is it not included within phase one? Because it, to me, it sounds like it has nothing to do with the traffic. It would, it would no longer meet the fire district requirements for the distance with one. Oh, because it, so it's Correct. the fire, it's not the traffic. That, because Correct. It's, well, it's, a, little bit of, it's a little bit of both. They, they run hand in hand. So it's the number of units which generates the traffic, right? So well, right, but those added units plus that day. distance now becomes the issue without another outlet. Got it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just a little, little messier may, than may I May I ask? Uh, yes, question please. Is, yeah, yeah, we're going to go around one more time. quite obvious, uh, mm -hmm. but I want, I want a little clarity. Yeah. Uh, so the reduced unit total of multifamily in RP4 is 69. That is inclusive of the gray area that's in phase that, two. That includes nothing in phase two. That is only in the phase one area. Okay. So north of the so the, what's in the red boundary line of this graphic, yep. the sixty nine units are within that red area. Perfect. Um, the south end you'll kind of see you don't see any building footprint kind of concept footprints there. That's because that's where the uh, stormwater drainage detention facility would be. Perfect. Uh, thank thank you for the clarity. So just carrying on to that question, I'm. For me, the, the traffic concerns aren't addressed. I, I want to make that known. Uh, and maybe Mr. Holland can, can help or he can develop. But I'm, I'm concerned, or maybe I'm trying to figure out why 69 now multifamily units are being squeezed into nine acres versus single family. Plus, for me, as it relates to traffic, density, obviously, the multi-family would tend to bring more traffic Absolutely. than that of a single family. So, uh, I, get, I, I, get, I guess I'd start with the fact, well, saying first off that the comp plan shows it as being medium density, medium family, you know, medium density. Medium, right. And, and we meet, we're within those parameters. I think we're at six or something <coughs> like that. So it's not s squeezed in, um, in our opinion. Uh, I'm not sure what your concern about the traffic is. Um, is it the traffic on 183rd Street? It's unique or where? Or not, and obviously everything that would feed through that, but specifically we, we don't, the RP4 uh, with the multifamily units with, within the, the development plan. Why, why would you squeeze multifamily units right where they are compared to building single family? Okay, well, I think, I think we've mentioned it a bunch, and, but just to call your attention to it again, to the west, immediate west, is so, several large warehouse buildings yeah. right to our west. Those, so, so it's very challenging to put s the single family homes up against warehouse buildings, right? What does that mean? It's just. Nobody wants to live next to a warehouse. Not always, not always, it's an opinion. Okay. So sure. townhomes make a difference. Duplexes work just north. Right. I mean, yeah. 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 So, so I think the developer is in complying with the, the comp plan. The traffic, there isn't any traffic issue according to our traffic engineer, according to your city traffic engineer. I'm not sure what traffic concerns you specifically have. Sure. This traffic will dump onto 183rd Street. We are not accessing Butternut, to be clear. We're not accessing any of these streets to our east, to be clear, with this plan. The traffic uh, to be, you know, that will run to or go to 183rd Street is well, well, well below the capacity of 183rd Street. So I'm not sure where your concern is regarding traffic. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to even address that. Yeah, uh, sure. Where and or how my and I, I, I guess were, I know I you made a comment about Butternut, so I, I just want to remind you all there's no current connections from this pl preliminary development plan into Butternut. And for them to essentially you their road up around back into Butternut from the south phase two, they would have to come back to you and ask for permission to do that. So I do just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Sure. And so directly, uh, 
this is not a question of how long this guy had bullet in his jail. Mm. Uh, it's, it's really a question of how often you and or your developers have spent time in this area recently. Without this developer, there are traffic problems already. I, on which streets? I'm, I'm not clear still. Please tell me. So, and, and even the south. just to clarify, we aren't adding any traffic, real traffic to the east, so you understand that, right? We we blocked the traffic from going that direction, so we can't do anything about an existing safe or traffic okay. issue in your. People come home to that particular location, so I mean, would would not new residents in some manner have the right to use traffic flow to the east? But I don't so know why they would. They couldn't fine. get they couldn't get to their home. I'm not sure what you're talking about. They can't, they can't get to their home but through 183rd Street. So then, then maybe, maybe it's me, maybe I'm confused. Uh, because in general, today without this development, there is serious traffic problem, dangerous traffic problem. There was a, a, a young child, I don't know the age, but their father was using his vehicle and he was hit. And while that's one incident, Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I think the the uh, the story or the the uh, relating of the the pedestrian who was uh, hurt maybe um, took place to the to the east in that subdivision. Um, and again, we're not accessing that at all. We have no access to those roads, so we're not <coughs> exacerbating any traffic issue. If there is a traffic issue, I'm not going to deny it. Um, I don't live there. Um, but uh, we aren't increasing or adding to any of that traffic in that neighborhood. We are adding traffic to 183rd Street, yes. Um, but we're well, well below the capacity of 183rd Street. To my knowledge, the city hasn't acknowledged or said that there's any kind of a traffic issue on 183rd Street. There might be a perception that there's a lot of traffic on 183rd Street, uh, but there's not any real traffic issue there. I think the level of service is probably an A on 183rd Street, which is the highest you can get. I'm guessing it's an A. It might be a B, but it's pretty high. Is it an A? So that's how we that's how we look at traffic and look at intersections and whether or not we've got a safety issue. And I think we check all the boxes uh, on that issue. So I'm. Sure, well, I'm I appreciate. Yeah, I'm sorry you feel that way, but uh, I, I, I understand. I, I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, Kind of circling back to the value uh, that I mentioned earlier, while you made it very clear that no one's going to buy a single family home next to a warehouse, you're making a really big assumption that multifamily units, which are less expensive, will be acquired more rapidly than that of a single family unit. And, and I, I have concern secondarily maybe some of the precedent that we in the Gardner community have seen. As Commissioner McNear mentioned, I'll even mention Wildcat Run. That was a development that several of the residents brought up in comparison at the public hearing. So as, as we hear those that live in that community and certainly look at what what is attempting to be done, those are what I know is a question they're going to be Yeah, I, I would just in response say that the homes we intend to build here are going to be at least uh, uh, the value of it and probably more than the homes that we're building next to. Um, the townhome units will be 250-ish a unit. So um, that's substantial in terms of value. Um, I hear this time and again about impact of property value and I have yet to see it in Johnson County anywhere. Uh, even when we're talking about uh, apartment development, which is certainly more dense, and usually that's where you hear it. Um, it's, it's, 
I'm not used to hearing the term multifamily uh, with townhomes, um, you know, twin villas, duplexes, you know, they're more than a single family home too. So I, using the word multifamily, it's just maybe in my brain. Uh, I, uh, my, my first immediate thought is apartments when I hear multifamily. That, these are townhomes. Um, so um, we think the values will be, we're not, we don't think we're gonna impact any values to uh, the adjoining properties. It's probably an increase in the value um, or could. I'm not sure everybody wants to hear that, but it's certainly not a negative impact. And I would, I would challenge anybody to bring me a study that says that. So um, I hear it a lot, don't see it. And I'd love to go talk to the Johnson, well, Johnson County Appraiser's Office. Well, if they were standing here would probably agree with me. Okay, anyway. thank you. Thanks. Hey, remember guys, uh, thank you guys, really appreciate it. We do, what we're looking at here is specific to a reason, right? And the things that Planning Commission looks at, you know, we have staff report, we've had um, our, our traffic conversation, and now it's, you know, it's, it's a reason. Um, so we look at not only, you know, code, but we look at comprehensive plan. What has this been planned for in the future use? You know, what does that land use map say? You know, is this really a, is it too dense, too intense, or does it fit the character of the neighborhood? You know, we've received public comments, um, which that was amazing to have so many folks with us. Um, so just, you know, really everybody back in. This is a rezoning, right? So we're looking at that zoning, and then, you know, from there, okay, what does that planned development look like, and does that meet our, you know, criteria from staff's perspective? So just kind of really everybody back in. We don't care about values. We don't care about HOAs. We don't care about covenants. We don't care about who did what. You know, just very, planning commission has got a set of guidelines to apply. So just remind you guys that. Um, and Madam Chair, I'll just, I'll add to that sure. just briefly. Um, the comprehensive plan, the sub-area plan that was approved for this area does show it as medium density residential, which says six units to 16 units per acre. Um, this proposed development is well under the threshold of 16. It's closer to that six. It might be slightly over that six units per acre. And I think that helped there, Dave, to kind of put things into perspective when it comes to, you know, thinking about the density and of, the, of the use. Um, Commissioner Cooper, did you have something you wanted to add? I I, I do have a question, and it is, uh, and I've had this conversation with Dave before, so I'm just bringing it to the public, but at some point, there has to be, um, the citizens and the community, their voice has to be measured, and the motion before us that we talked only about the, the plan, and I'm, my, my question is, at what point do we value Which, you know, we've got a couple of different motions, to, you know, there's still our, our standing motion of denial that we can go with too. So just because staff's making a recommendation, it's just a recommendation, so. I just wanted to raise that. Absolutely. Um, I'll just keep going around. Commissioner Cooper, any other final no, comments? No, I had a question about the fire, um, the fire safety. And that did, did it get answered? Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, excellent. Uh, Commissioner Juneman, did you have any final thoughts? Commissioner McMahon? Yes, uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, again, thanks to everybody for the hard work and, the, and listening back in March and April and now May. Uh, tonight has been very helpful for the way I look at this. Uh, as I understand it, just so I, I can just kind of verbalize what I, what I think I've heard, uh, we've seen the 184th, 184th Terrace, 185th are closed off and called the sacks. Uh, historically, traffic on those is going to be what would have been had those been part of the original, H, you know, part of the original development. So that's not going. That's really not an impact. And the the two sides of this thing on the poplar don't connect. Uh, I'm satisfied with the uh, the fact that we've been that people were listening and to the concerns of the public uh, that uh, that we try to restrict access to or and, and of course came back to us. There's no traffic. To uh, and, and, the, and it's also my understanding that any connection to Butternut is going to have to be part of another proposal process and another process similar to this. So uh, at that point, I'm comfortable. Originally, on the first time, 
do this, I had uh, recused myself because I had family and kids and grandkids that lived in the, in the community. And at this point, I, I don't have a problem voting uh, one way or the other on it because uh, I, I believe that the, a lot of the concerns at that point have been listened to. And quite frankly, I was impressed with what came back to us tonight. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Ham, anything last minute? Um, no. Um, to uh, build up what uh, Commissioner McNear said, just to uh, make sure that it's on the record, popular to 183rd, it's minor arterial, and it can hold 12,000, and we're only looking at 3,000, mm -hmm. which is much, much um, improved than what we were looking at before. Um, so that was the major concern, and looking at my notes from our last public hearing, traffic, there were comments about home values and things like that, but the, the majority of the concerns were traffic, and this has met all of those concerns and things. Okay. Commissioner Sosa, anything else? Mr. Combs, any final thoughts? No other questions. Okay. Just, just a question since we do have our um, uh, city traffic person. What is that um, intersection of street operating at as far as a level of service? Uh, currently, I believe it was a level A in the basically no development scenario in the, in the original EIS. So it, yeah, it's as good as you can be for a local street to a arterial connection. A, a local street? Currently, uh, Poplar, I guess, technically would be a future collector, but it's operating as a local right now. So that's Poplar to the north. Poplar, right? okay, Poplar. Um, Poplar and so in the, I believe in the in all the scenarios, it never got past a level B. But that was again the previous uh, de development plan. So we will have to look at that again. I don't anticipate it being any different. Okay. Thank you for that. I just wanted a little and, clarification for the Yeah, record. and just wanted to, to quickly clarify. So the goal of the street network is to take traffic from locals to collectors to arterials. Poplar is essentially a collector uh, in this development plan. Um, so we essentially are putting no traffic on any local streets. Um, and the yeah, we have no concerns with the arterial and the collector in this case. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, if there's no other uh, questions, comments, um, are we good? Spencer, you're like, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, good, gotcha, gotcha. Um, there's no other comments, questions, I'll entertain a motion on the I'll side. make that motion. Okay. A motion to submit new, uh, a new recommendation of approval of application Z-22-09 and PDP-22-09 rezoning in the associated Revised Preliminary Development Plan and PP-22-06 Revised Preliminary Plat for Fairfield Townhomes, including uh, proposed uh, phasing and zoning approach to the governing body with the following conditions. One, approval of the deviation as presented in the staff report. That's okay. Uh, number two, the stormwater management plan shall meet uh, the conveyance, detention, water quality, and other requirements found in Title 14 of the City of Gardner Municipal Code and other incorporated documents. Three, no further development will be allowed past phase one unless access is provided to Gardner Road and or 188th Street. Uh, four, connect uh, errors with the legal description on both the preliminary plan and preliminary development plan. Five, corrected cul-de-sac right of the way for uh, location for both 184th and 185th Street. And, and six, provide uh, street and, op and open uh, and civic space types to the preliminary development plan. Seven, submit updated traffic impact study uh, reflecting revised preliminary, or preliminary development plan. 
motion made by McNear with a second by hand. Any discussions on the motion? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. So the motion carries with. We had one opposed? We had two. Two? Yeah, I heard. Which ones? I'm sorry. It would be uh, Cooper and Maynard are the no's. Was there another no down on this end? I thought I heard five five yeas and, and two nay and two no's. Okay. It went so fast. I heard I it. Okay. <laughs> that's why I'm that's why I'm in charge, Dave. Thanks for the double yep. check. Yep, so for the for the record then it would be a, a Mater and a Cooper um, being the names. Who's the no's? Okay. All right, moving on the last item here we have a discussion item um, B number one the Kansas Open Meetings Act, we have coma training. Do we have a brief presentation this evening on that? Well, everyone can stay if they want to. All right. Um, I find it riveting. Feel free to stay if you want. There's the stay. You ready? Open yeah. Cool. So I, we, uh, yeah, I will Thanks try to get through this fairly quickly. We just wanted to. We've got some new members on. Welcome aboard. Um, we wanted to give you a quick, just brief update, um, refresher on the Kansas Open Meetings Act or COMA. Uh, so. Just again, so this is a state statute type thing. Uh, it's KSA 754317, in case any of you were curious. Uh, it's from the 70s, and the intent was to ensure an open government to the public. Um, and when the legislator passed this, they made a specific intent that it was going to be interpreted liberally. And what that means is that if there's any questions, it gets interpreted in favor of openness to the public. Uh, so it applies to covered entities and meetings. Um, and just so we're all on the same page, your planning commission, and I give this to BZS too, so your board of zoning appeals, but your planning commission is a covered entity, and these planning commission meetings are meetings. Uh, you guys probably didn't mean, need me to tell you that. The important stuff is getting into what is a meeting. So there's a statutory definition, gathering or assembly, use of telephone or any other medium, so in person, Zoom, phone, all of that, uh, by a majority of the membership of this body. Uh, for the purpose of discussing the business of this body. So the important things there are, are in our majority, that's always going to be four on this. And if there's open seats, they still count towards that. So if there's two empties, that doesn't change what our majority is. We still have four there, and it triggers the Open Meetings Act. Um, so one of the things that hits in that statute is interactive communication. So obviously regular special meetings. Anytime you guys get an email from Melissa and you see a notice or an agenda go out, that's a meeting. Coma applies. Uh, work session's the same. If you're all on a conference call together, that's a meeting, uh, and we'll get to any potential exceptions there, but if you're on together talking about this stuff, it's a meeting. That can go to video calls, that can go to chance meetings. Um, so if for some reason all of you go to the grocery store at the same time, and you decide to start, talk, start talking about the planning commission because you just can't get enough of it while you're here, <laughs> you're violating the Open Meetings Act. If you all meet at the store and want to talk about the Royals or just about how bad I messed up last week, that's probably fine. But once you start talking about planning commission business, we get into the Open Meetings Act. So one thing to, I guess, point out on this is online communication is a newer issue. Uh, and the Attorney General's office uh, enforces this, and they're always kind of catching up to everything. But emails can kick into a meeting and count as an interactive communication. Um, and they call it serial messages, serial meetings. So um, if one of you emails the other one, even about the planning commission, that's okay. That's not an open meeting. If one of you sends an email to all of you, everybody else, now we're getting into the Open Meetings Act. And if you try to get around it by me emailing each one of you one by one by one, one minute apart, 
We call that a serial communication. That's an interactive communication. A majority of the body is in there. So even if I just email four of them, sorry, there we go. Now there's something to talk about. Um, we violated coma. So you need to be cognizant of it's not just the physical presence or all of you being together, but those one-on-one -on -one communications, add them all up. And if it gets to a majority, we're in the Open Meetings Act. Um, the other thing is, is, again, you are welcome to all meet together at the store or wherever. You're all welcome to get on a text chain or one-on-one -on -one text until you start talking about the business of the body. Um, so the business of the body here is the planning commission, so zoning, development, all of that. That's where you need to be cognizant of. These meetings are recorded. Everybody knows who's on this body, so we always want you to avoid the appearance of impropriety. If there's four or more of you at a meeting of some other group, just be aware. Uh, and there's nothing stopping those four or five, six, seven of you from getting together and talking about whatever you want. Just always be aware of how that might look and make sure you're not accidentally talking about the last meeting or the next meeting or what new development you might like to see. Um, and it doesn't require a vote. It doesn't require any binding action to be taken. You just have to be there and, and talk about the business, business of the body. Uh, so I hit this a little bit on serial meetings. The important thing is, is there's one common topic throughout multiple communications. Um, and those multiple communications add up to become um, an open meeting. So one example that's uh, a curse of social media, but there was a county board of commissioners. It was three people. They were out in central Kansas. They had a vote on a development plan after the meeting. Um, no surprise, a Facebook conversation started up on the county community Facebook page. Two of the three commissioners got on that comment section. We're going back and forth talking to each other and responding to questions and saying why they voted like they voted and what they thought about the plan. And once they started talking to each other about that in the comments and directly commenting to each other, the Attorney General found that that was an Open Meetings Act issue. They violated the Open Meetings Act. So just be aware. I mean, I, lots of Facebook issues. It could be Twitter. It could be Nextdoor or the Ring app or whatever there is out there now. Just be aware that once you start feel that congregation happening, you need to be careful. Um, so what the Open Meetings Act requires is that meetings be open to the public. You can't take any binding action by secret ballot. So you all don't really go into executive session, but you'll notice the city council will go into executive session and they're not taking any binding action back there. They're just talking about something. Um, you can't prohibit the use of recording devices, and these are all recorded anyway, so that's pretty easy. You have to give the notice, date, time, place of meeting. That's why our notices go out. Um, and we don't have to publish our agendas, but if there is an agenda, we publish it. So technically, we don't need an agenda, but you always have one, and we always make that public. So uh, closing out here, the teeth of this is that there are penalties for messing up. It's not just a slap on the wrist. So um, the attorney general can come in and undo a decision you made if it was made in violation of the Open Meetings Act. Um, they can fine the city or individually, each of you, $500. Um, they can assess the court costs of having to impose those. They can assess attorney's fees, um, and they can invalidate any action you take. They can pull you out of office. So, uh, you know, I've never seen anyone that, that we represent get into an Open Meetings Act violation, have the attorney general come after them. So I would love it if you guys could keep our streak alive. Uh, I have full faith that you will. And really, the important thing is always going to be just you're never going to have a chance meeting with a body this big where like five of you are all at the same place for the most part. Um, but just watch those communications, those emails back and forth or texts or whatever, phone calls count, that type of thing. So just be cognizant uh, as you're deliberating and coming to opinions that, you know, we're doing it here in front of everyone and always err on the side of everybody seeing your thought process. And that's it. Sure, so an abstentions and recusals aren't necessarily an Open Meetings Act thing, but I'll touch it real briefly. So a recusal is if you have a conflict of interest, and it's usually a money conflict of interest, you get up and you leave. That's a recusal. An abstention is just saying, I don't know that I can make this vote today. Um, Mr. McNear, Commissioner McNear, it, it kind of explained why there was a family issue, and it sounds like in the last whatever month since we discussed it, it we've had more time to consider with family uh, and, and, and that. I guess you were comfortable making that decision. The decision to abstain is up to each of you in, in your personal judgment. Um, and I would encourage you, again, err on the side of against voting if you think there's a conflict or an issue. Um, and always 
you guys are welcome to contact staff. If you don't want to bother Dave, you are always welcome to contact me. My email is super easy. It is slow at mvplaw.com. Whoa. I will get back to you fast, uh, or as fast as I can. Holy. Yeah. Uh, and if that doesn't work, you, my uh, direct office line is on our website. You can look me up and give that a call. It rings straight to my cell phone. So, yeah, uh, it's unfortunate. So, so I have a question. Yeah. yeah. So it, I didn't understand why he was able to do today. Sure, and so you all know the conversation we had was me asking if he was going to abstain or recuse or not, and making sure that whatever decision was announced to you all. So, and, and just to be clear, just to be clear, I made it, made it very clear that the reason that I was not abstaining today is that the issues that caused prevented me from voting for or against it, which was safety in the neighborhood of Fairfield have been addressed, and, and I felt comfortable that, uh, that not only my kids and grandkids were taken care of or were being considered, but all the residents of Fairfield and, and, and the, the developer had come back with a, a well-written. And without turning this into too much of a Machiavelli, the ends justify, at the end of the day, that vote wasn't the deciding vote, so less of an issue there. It wasn't a 4-3, it was a 5 so It would have been a, a 4-2-1 without him, but not that, yeah, no, just so you all know, I mean, the end result was going to be the same whether he abstained or not. Propriety, which is what all of the Open Meeting Act stuff is about. And, you know, I've worked in government long enough that I know that anything can be the appearance of impropriety. And when that happened, it raised a red flag for me. And I felt like if it's raising a red flag for me, it's probably raising a red flag for somebody else. And I felt like we should address it openly. And that's why. So, yeah. No, yeah, I appreciate you guys. That's, yeah, spirit of openness. So. Absolutely. I just, and I just want to reiterate something that you had mentioned earlier, a little bit different topic. Conversations about how you vote and how you feel when they go out there in the public and you start doing that, I want you to, to understand um, there are people that are monitoring those things. And I've always told my planning commissions before, be very careful about how you portray yourself and what you say in texts and in emails. It's not an open meeting side of this, but if an applicant or a citizen feels wrong by a decision was made and they decide to do a court challenge, they're going to call all of that open public conversation that you put out there with your own individual opinions about how you felt, and they're going to utilize that. So you've got to be very careful because when we take votes, it's part of the reason some of these motions are written the way they are, because that should be a common understanding that you all understand the motion and you're voting on it based on what you heard as part of the meeting and the record of the meeting. You can have disagreements, obviously. It, it does not mean that you have to vote unanimously for or against it, but you do have to be very careful about how you're portraying yourselves outside of the meeting framework and format, I, I think, from that standpoint, Spencer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Outside of this, I, I litigate and Facebook posts, emails, texts are, are in every single case as an exhibit. So just assume that someone's going to see, if you're talking about planning commission stuff, text, email, whatever, assume at some point someone might have, probably me since I would be defending the city, we'll have to look through that. Um, so if you don't want me to see it, you know, maybe don't say it. Right? Yeah. It's too late. So it's yeah, and, and like it, that's the only cool part of my job is snooping through people's stuff. So. <laughs> so it's okay to reach out to you if you have a question regarding oh, sure. mm -hmm. the process? Right, absolutely, yeah. And you're welcome uh, to email Dave and I, I on the same email. but Because I was emailing him. I didn't know if it was okay to yeah. reach out to you. Otherwise, you're going to be charged in the city. I was afraid no. of that. <laughs> no, so <laughs> here's the thing. Dave, I, what I would recommend is you guys start with Dave because 99% oh, okay. of the time he's going to know the answer and probably faster than me. Uh, if Dave doesn't know, his next email is usually to me, and a lot of times he'll CC you guys on his email to me. But so, I, you know, your staff is a good resource. I would start with him, but I just want you to be aware I'm available for you all. Oh, okay. So it's it's that. part of it's part of the service they're here to okay. provide you. So I, I would tell you I like being in on those just because sure. if I know what's going on, it helps me later on when I'm talking to Spencer yeah. and 
and if we're talking about a case and he goes, oh, by the way, did you know XYZ commissioner has, and I'm kind of surprised by that. I'd rather that I know up front if there's an issue there yeah. coming into the meeting. So you guys are aware, unless you're complaining about Dave, I'm going to probably forward whatever he, you sent me in my response you what, to him, so he's aware. And if I, you complain and it's it's funny, he's probably going to see it You anyway can too, include so. me in on the complaint. It yeah. doesn't matter. It's, <laughs> You can leave me at complaints about me. I it doesn't yeah, offend me. Fragile. I've been called a lot of things in my career. So. Well, and, and since I'm the, the newest member, just to be clear back to the phone, uh, if, if we find ourselves in the same, same location as other commissioners and we're talking about the lawyers, no problem. Right. Not that there's even a particular problem if we're talking about planning commission items. However, Two or more, and you're talking about planning commission items, that is deemed a, a meeting in general. No, so it still has to be a majority of you. So two of you can get together and talk about, so like, if, if you have a question and you want to ask your, your chair, that's fine. Um, so it would be four or more of you guys would, would constitute. Yeah. So you're allowed in the serial yeah. piece. And yeah. That, uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I will. But watch the reply all. <laughs> yeah, please don't ever reply all to these. Yeah, that's the rule. <laughs> I will tell you this, though, too, is if you find yourselves at meetings and one of you does not feel comfortable being seen in that conversation, do not be offended if that other member says, hey, I don't really want to talk about this. Because so many of these issues, and I think this is what Commissioner Cooper is kind of getting to, they're individual calls. You know, there's a lot of gray area that's sitting in here. And it's just like I was told as a private consultant and other things that I did in past career, you know, you want to be, be, be careful who you're seen with and what you're maybe talking to because the assumption isn't always it's just talking about the royals. Right. Um, I, I used to have to be, I still have to be very careful. I worked for the city of Gardner. I have a lot of consulting friends because I had 20 years of consulting experience. So I bridged that gap a lot. Well, me going to lunch with a consultant that I know is a friend but yet has a case before us as a planning commission, if I'm sitting at a restaurant at Austin's, for instance, and some citizens see me, they go, well, wait a minute, what's going on there, right? Are they, buy, are they buying me lunch? Are they go, you know, all kinds of things. So it's the same kind of thing in these conversations, just being careful. And if one of you does not feel comfortable in engaging in that, let the other one know politely and walk away. And don't be offended if that happens, because it's an individual call at that point. Spencer, anybody else have anything they want to bring up for Spencer or oh, staff? Yes. I was not right with you, Spencer. I can make a motion to close the meeting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I do. I do want to bring up one item before we. Okay. Oh, we do. Yes, I do. But we do have a first yeah. and a second. So. Yeah, this will be very quickly. Yes. We will have a meeting next month. Okay. There is one item on the agenda at this point, which is the capital improvements program review, which is the consistency with the comp plan. It's an annual process so the finance director is putting together all that information and that'll be next month on the 26th for you all so just be aware of that during the next few weeks um, I am out from Memorial Day through Juneteenth so I will not be in the office and if, Enjoy. if you try to reach me I pretty much you won't hear from me Good. <laughs> okay. Good. So, You're getting so that I'm, slow email. I'm going to be only emailing the slow. That's <laughs> it. Um, mainly because I'm going to be in time zones that are far off from this time zone. So even even if you do try to reach me, right. odds are I'm not looking at it. But the second odd is I'm going to be so far behind that it's not going to matter. So Bob, Bob will be um, available to you. Spencer obviously is available to you. Um, with no big items coming up, no applications. We shouldn't have a whole lot of questions on cases and things like that. Um, also, I'm gonna be talking to um, the city administrator and that just to confirm, but at the two cases you had tonight, my intent is to hold those until June 20th, uh, plan uh, city council meeting. Because of the intricacy of both of those, I felt more comfortable that I'd be here for those uh, city council discussions on those two items um, because if I, I'm going to miss the city council meeting. So I just want to make you all aware of that. If you get emails you're, or send me an email, you're going to get a response back, an auto response. It just says, yeah, good luck. 
<laughs> Enjoy. So, yeah. Okay. And Thank I've, you. I've got a question on that email that I received. So should, like, that just so happened to come in before I was coming here. From now on, like, if I were to receive that yesterday, send that on to you? I would, I think uh, we would appreciate getting copies of it. Um, I can send Primarily you because we can put that in the record for the case. And that way we can, you know, label it as came to the planning commissioner and it's at least in there okay. um, for the for the files. Okay. It may not come into the record as part, as you notice tonight, it was not read into the record as necessarily that because that would have been unfair to the people who were sitting here that we weren't allowing to mm -hmm. speak. Not allowing, we weren't going to invite to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important. But certainly when you all have those kinds of communications, feel comfortable, if they're asking you questions in that, forward them to me. We can sometimes respond from a staff viewpoint instead of you all trying to respond and maybe saying something that isn't accurate or is just not, you're not sure, but you feel like you have to respond and you find yourself then in a conversation. It's an easy way just to engage you, right? Just be like, you know, hey, yeah. I can engage so, staff, I copy you on. Yeah, you and, and you do a great job. You've done that before on a couple things okay. where you've emailed me and said, hey, got this or whatever, yeah. and I think Commissioner Sosa's done that too a couple times, and, and we either handle, you know, get it to the right staff member or whatever to get it addressed. So, so the best way to go to those, as a forward to staff, you or one of the staff and say, hey, uh, staff, please answer this question. Can yeah. you address this? Yeah. Received yeah. this email last it. night. Could you take a look yeah. at it and address it? Yeah. Okay. Always start with Bob. It ends up there most times anyway. Well, whether it's forward or backwards, so Bob. <laughs> but oh but we will try to respond, and then that way, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll either copy you or blind copy you in on our responses so that you know that we responded and you know what we said. Okay. So. I'll, I'll send that to you tomorrow. <coughs> okay. That's all I've got. Perfect. All right, let's see if we can proceed. We've got a uh, motion made by Juniman with a second by McNear to adjourn. All those in favor? Second. Everybody saying aye. 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 I suppose meetings adjourned. <laughs>